again. Sorry, Athena. All right. No problem. Right. We're recording now. Excellent. It is 4.32 p.m. on June 23rd, 2022, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee. I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 22, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to call on both the members of the committee and our three applicants for ZBA interviews to make sure we can hear everyone and everyone can hear us. So I'm going to start with members of the committee. Shalini. I'm here. Um, Mandy is here. Pat? Present. Uh, Pam Rooney? Present. And Jennifer Tubb? Present. And now we have John Gilbert? Present. Steve Judge? Present. And Sarah Marshall. Present. Welcome to everyone. Um, uh, we're going to go into the interviews. Um, we don't have public hearings. So we're going to move right to the interviews. I sent out um, yesterday, I think, the schedule to the CRC members for which questions are being asked. Um, so everyone should have that. I can assist if necessary for that. The applicants will have up to three minutes to answer each question. I will be the one timing um, all of them. And we will switch the order of response throughout the interview. So you're not always following the same person and you're not always going for second or third. Um, we will, however, there is a fourth applicant that cannot attend the interview today. Um, we're not going to discuss anything about whether that person can actually be an applicant because it violates our policy for them not to attend the interview until we get to the recommendation stage. But um, in an attempt to be accommodating and offer as much options as possible to the council and the committee, that person has submitted answers, written answers to the interview questions. They are in the packet, but I will also read them forth at the end of everyone's answers. So they will be read forth um, by me. Um, for each question in that order. And then when we get to the discussion section, we will discuss um, what to do about that. Um, but I wanted to indicate that to the three applicants that are here um, in accordance with our policy that says in order to be an applicant, you have to attend the interview. So with that, we're gonna get started. Um, I am asking the first question and the order of answer will be John, then Sarah, then Steve. And the question is, what do you feel you bring to the ZBA that can make it successful? Please include any experience you have appearing before the planning board or ZBA or watching one of their meetings. John. Great. Um, so I have been serving on the ZBA for the past year as an elected full-time member, had you know, extensive experience already um, supporting the ZBA and the town of Amherst um, in you know, sort of directing some of these projects that have, have come through. My background is in architecture. I'm a registered Massachusetts architect, uh, graduate from the UMass Amherst uh, graduate program in architecture. So I've worked about seven years professionally as an architect uh, in a lot of design capacities, as well as um, in, in some consulting forms with real estate developers throughout the state. Um, you know, I've got extensive experience in the built environment and um, again, with respect to the ZBA, have you know been able to provide some value over the course of the past year um, through, through its expertise. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. Thank you. Well, I have never appeared before or served on the planning board or ZBA. I have attended parts of planning board meetings and commented a very small number of times. And I have not watched a ZBA meeting in real time, but I have watched several recorded meetings in whole or part and looked at agendas and packets. Nor, unfortunately, am I a builder, engineer, or architect, although I am married to an architect who can be a resource for me um, if I need to understand plans and submissions. But what I will bring to the board if I am appointed as full-time or associate member is my proven experience as a dedicated member of various committees and boards, particularly the Recreation Committee and Community Preservation Act Committee, or CPAC. 
I'm stepping down from those positions after about five years of service. And I think that my colleagues on those committees would say that I prepare thoroughly, am collegial and listen to the input of others. I respect the constraints of open meeting law and as chair of CPAC, manage meetings efficiently. I have paid close attention to the details of the CPA program, our application and review processes and CPA's finances. And I think my presentations on behalf of CPAC to the Finance Committee and Town Council have been focused and responsive to concerns. So I feel I have the uh, committee skills, if not the training that would enable me to be an effective member. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Steve. Well, I've served on the ZBA for five years. One is a associate member, two is a uh, two years as a, uh, a full member and two years as chair. So I think I have the experience to and knowledge uh, about the ZBA to be a, a valuable, to continue to be a valuable member. Um, I've not appeared, but I've watched the planning board. Uh, but I think they have a little different focus. They do have a different focus than we do on the ZBA. And I think it's uh, helpful for us to, to, look at the, to look at the planning board. But I think my experience is more closely with the ZBA and I, I think that the ZBA has run well in the last two years and since I've been chairman and I anticipate it would continue to run well um, with me as a member, whether chairman or not. Thank you, Steve. And I'm going to now read John Varner's written response to question number one. While I have never brought an issue before the ZBA or planning board, I feel my experiences on serving on town meeting for six years, including the years of debate on the last parking garage and my functioning as a member of a professional organization representing acupuncturists before the Massachusetts Board of Medicine and at public hearings and meetings have given me insight into the workings of governing bodies working on difficult issues. Uh, we next will move to Shalini to ask question number two. All right, so this time we're going to start with Sarah. And the question is, tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. Thank you. Some of you will be familiar with what I'm going to say. Um, so during my time on CPAC, the Friends of the Jones Library first submitted a request for a million dollars grant two and a half years ago. And in all my service on that committee, no other request triggered as much disagreement among committee members as that one. And naturally, public comment was also strong on both sides. And despite extensive discussion, there was no meeting of the minds in that case. The vote was split, members disagreed, but everyone was civil and discussed the pros and cons in detail. That particular request from the library was first approved, then withdrawn, and then it submitted a new proposal in the next grant round. And while CPAC unanimously voted for the second proposal, we still received numerous comments in writing and at the hearing, both supporting and objecting to the project. But we kept our focus on the grant application and on the purpose and requirements of the CPA program and set aside comments that asked us to go beyond our authority or raise matters that were not for CPAC to decide. Thank you. Uh, next is Steve Judge. Do you want me to repeat the question? No, I, I think I got it, Jelani. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I've had tons of experience with um, organizations dealing with conflict. It's um, my career before I came to Amherst was I was first a congressional staffer. I was a deputy staff director for the House Banking Committee. And in that role, you try to um, you try to find a, a, a center path or a, a mid path between competing, often warring factions. And, uh, I, and while it's not the staff's role to take votes, the staff role is to facilitate that. So I was, I had a lot of experience watching and uh, facilitating uh, consensus or at least majority rule amongst uh, 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 very highly opinionated people and 
very uh, fraught circumstances. Later on, I was the uh, president and CEO of a trade association of financial service firms. As such, I ran the, I, I chaired the board of directors. Um, these were high powered uh, firms and individuals who had competing goals. And the, the goal of the organization was to hold the whole industry together um, and to do that successfully. And we did. And so my professional experience has been almost entirely in legislative, political board kinds of works. And I think that draws well upon, well, it sets me up well to continue to work on the, the ZBA. And I think in the ZBA, we've done a pretty good job of um, getting consensus out of the ZBA when possible. John, you're next. Great, yeah, I'll uh, maybe hopscotch off a little what Steve said there. You know, working on the ZBA um, with, with Steve and the you know other members for this past year, there, there have been moments of, um, I would, you know, I'd say conflict and sort of disagreements, but in general, um, I think we've been pretty successful at having um, sort of a meeting of the minds on a lot of these projects, even where there are base level disagreements. Um, you know, sort of historically throughout my career, again, as an architect, um, dealing with CBA in Boston in particular, um, professionally, on projects that I was designing and managing, you know, there's a lot of competing interests, of course, um, with the developer, with the designer, uh, with the members of the public, with the butters. And, you know, a lot of what my work in this public sort of forum was about was sort of guiding the design intent, um, knowing what the developer's goals were, but also knowing how these projects, of course, impacted the immediate community members and trying to sort of relay all of this information into, you know, final product. So, I'd say throughout the course of my career, um, I've you know I've I've been uh, I've been exposed to a lot of conflict, of course, through through building. Um, but you know I've felt a pretty successful approach to make sure that you know multiple opinions um, are being considered, you know, in, in pushing ideas forward um, in order to create the best benefit at the end of the day. Thank you, John. And now I'll read John Barner's answer. Um, I have served in several organizations in various roles of governance. I was a member of the board of the Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine Society of Massachusetts for many fractious years while we sought insurance and licensure reforms. I was an Amherst Town meeting member for six years. I was a union shop steward at UMass during the period I took graduate courses there. And I am currently co-director and studio manager for the Mud Pie Pottery Collective Studio at Lever Crack. Crafts and Arts Center. In these capacities, I have maintained a stance of principled idealism while seeking realistic solutions to a wide variety of problems, personal, logistical, and organizational. Thank you, Mandy Cho. Over to you, Jennifer. Oops. I'm sorry, I just did skip down to Pat. Um, so the, um, this question will first be directed to Sarah and then Steve and John. So, uh, and the question is, do you understand the role of the ZBA and how it differs from the role of the planning board? Sarah, thanks. Well, I think I do to a degree, but I'm sure I have much to learn. Um, their spheres of action as specified in the zoning bylaw and the regs seem to be distinct and not overlapping, which is important in my case because my husband is serving on the planning board. And importantly, it is my understanding that neither body oversees the decisions of the other so that their territories are mutually exclusive. Um, I understand that the ZBA handles four types of actions. As the name indicates, the board hears appeals from property owners who are unhappy with either actions of the building commissioner or who are appealing certain provisions of the zoning bylaw. And the other two types of work for the ZBA are to develop and grant special permits and comprehensive permits for affordable housing projects. Why certain special permits are assigned to the ZBA and others to the planning board, I do not know, but I doubt it, I need to know. Um, and one thing that the planning board does that the ZBA does not, as far as 
I understand, is to develop new bylaws. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and we'll move to Steve. Would you like me to repeat the question? No, I got it here. Thank okay, you, good. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I do understand the, the two the different roles, although I don't understand totally the role of the planning board because I haven't um, spent a lot of time focused on it. But the ZBA handles applications for special permits, variances, um, and appeals of the commissioner's uh, building commissioner's decisions. Um, by far, the biggest portion of that is special permits, which are really are a case by case, um, case by case evaluation, and then vote on whether a um, specific project can proceed based upon the zoning bylaw and the way in which the zoning bylaw permits the ZBA to grant exceptions, for lack of a better term, to the strict interpretation of the of the of the uh, bylaw, or the bylaw specifically allows that activity, but conditions that activity or use on a special permit. So the ZBA tends to be more case specific. The zoning, the planning board, uh, deals more with um, with pro with projects and when they're dealing with a specific case that deals with a project that is done by right on that property and really only has to make a decision regarding and recommendations regarding design uh, color for lack of a better term those kind of, it's it's, in, it's um artistic or aesthetic impact on the neighborhood which is probably not fair but it's what comes to mind to me in addition, they do a lot of work with um, plan, uh, recommending changes to zoning bylaws and doing some overall town planning and working with the master plan. So the ZBA is much more in a, a semi-adjudicative process of application of the zoning bylaws and the authority of the ZBA to make exceptions or to approve act, uh, uses that are approved, uh, allowed under the zoning bylaw. The planning board is more uh, site plan review for things by right, as well as more general or long-term planning role. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and John, would, would you like me to repeat the question? No, that's okay. okay. I got it now. Thanks. Um, yeah, so you know the, the planning board um, basically exists to help guide the growth and development of of the town of Amherst as a sort of larger uh, picture scope to it. Um, ZBA deals with case by case basis of projects um, that are not compatible basically with zoning law. However, based on the zoning bylaw, um, these projects are reviewed uh, for variances, um, special permits, et cetera. So I think, you know, generally with respect to everything that the other members here have said, um, you know, I think the planning board is having sort of broad uh, scope. In terms of how the town grows and develops, well, um, you know what the, what the focus is, of course, um, as Steve alluded to, aesthetics and um, you know things of that nature. Whereas the zoning board of appeals is dealing with these case by case projects um, based on the zoning bylaw. Thank you, and um, Mandy Jo to read John Varner's. Thank you, John Varner wrote yes. Planning board sets rules designed to address the development of the town at large, and ZBA deals with specific cases where planned projects conflict with established policies. Thank you. And now, Pat, <laughs> to you. You're muted. Lo siento. I'm sorry. Um, and I'm going to be speaking to Steve first or asking him to respond first. When interpreting a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider the original intent of the provision, its common sense meaning, or something else? I think it's all those. Uh, and so I guess it's something else, it's a combination. All those are uh, instructive to what we should consider in making our decisions. Um, and it's and it really is a case by case basis. So I don't think I'm not a strict constructionist. Um, from this, <laughs> Thank you. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that'd go over well in Amherst. I don't. There's very many of us. Um, I'm not a strict constructionist. I think um, it's a evolving process. Uh, common sense sometimes is just doesn't um, isn't. <laughs> 
isn't favored by the zoning bylaw. And that's just the way it is. I mean, so neither of them work all the time. And so I think it's something else. Um, there's times when there's just what seems to be common sense isn't permitted either by special, by any case. So uh, you can't always go by that and you have to follow the zoning bylaw. So that's the key, the key thing is following the zoning bylaw. Interpreting it um, is just to use your best judgment, the judgment of staff, the judgment of, um, of, of your other members and come to the best decision you can. Thank you. Um, John? Yeah, I agree oh. with Steve. It's all, it, it's all the above here. Um, you know, it's, it's common sense, it's original intent, um, but it's, it's really, uh, you know, it's a case by case basis. It's looking at the zoning bylaw as that um, applies to, you know, each and every project. But, um, you know, there's not one standard recipe. I and mean, of course, the bylaw exists for us to analyze these projects, but every project has its own sort of idiosyncrasies and you know, sometimes common sense butts up against the intent and um, you know, what's sort of clearly written within the bylaw. Um, there's times where the bylaw is also sort of open to interpretation and that's where the ZBA I think gains its strength uh, amongst its members, um, you know, sort of communicating their differences of opinions and trying to come to you know, general consensus here. So it's, it's all the above and it's a circumstantial case. Thank you. And Sarah, I skipped you, but now I'm asking you. Oh, that's all right. It's time for me to go last. <laughs> um, I find the question interesting because it suggests that the intent may conflict with common sense meaning. And since I don't know of any such case in the ZBA from experience, I've been trying to imagine an example. Um, perhaps there's a provision about where or how vehicles can be stored, which assumed that the vehicles would use fossil fuels. But maybe in the particular case in 2022, uh, the owner would only have electric vehicles, which was not envisioned when the bylaw was written. So common sense might tell us that the provision is not needed in such a case but whether legally the ZBA has the authority to waive or modify the provision is a different matter. Um, presumably conflicts like this hypothetical could prompt changes to the regulations over time. In any case, how can the ZBA know the intent of a provision if it is not spelled out in the bylaw? Um, I do feel like a constitutional scholar. I, this is more challenging. You might need to find the minutes of the discussion or a memo that explained the thinking behind um, the provision before it was adopted. In any case, my answer is also all of the above. And I would want as deep an understanding as I could get, certainly with advice from staff or the town's attorneys if necessary. And I would think that in the end, an interpretation cannot conflict with the general aims of the zoning bylaw or the master. Thank you, Sarah. Mandy? That would be Pam. Nope, nope. I have to read John Varner's answer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so John Varner wrote to that one, um, I'm losing my place, that's number four. Um, common sense should be applied to every act of governance, but as Franklin augured, common sense is an uncommon commodity. So we have established <laughs> codes to live by and appeals boards to apply common sense to the enforcement or alterations of the codes. Now it's Pam. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're gonna start with John Gilbert, then Steve, then Sarah. And the question is, whose interests do you think are most important in special permit or site plan review applications? The town staff, the landowner or applicant, the parties in interest, meaning the abutters or other residents? And we'll start with John Gilbert, please. Sure, thanks, Pam. Um, yeah, there's not one main uh, interest of importance, I would suggest. Um, it's a combination of all these things. I think I alluded to this in one of my earlier responses through you know, some of my work, for example, with CBA out here in Boston professionally. It's, um, you know, it, it's sort of a meeting of the minds on these projects. And again, the zoning bylaw exists to give uh, the CBA direction and, and guidance, but at the same time, um, you know, as has been stated, every project is different and, um, you know, certain projects might have differences of opinion from neighbors, from abutters, um, you know, from, from town staff. 
So it's it's really sort of holistically looking at all of these opinions and interests and concerns and using the zoning bylaw um, to give some direction to the decision that is made, um, obviously being considerate of um, you know, multiple perspectives in a way that in the long run will you know, hopefully benefit not only the most amount of people, but also redevelopment that has some you know, intergenerational benefits uh, long term as well. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I think John's right. Uh, they're, they're all important. Each of them have their role and not, no one of them is more important than the other. Um, town staff is incredibly, they have great expertise. They have institutional knowledge. They have the, um, they understand the zoning bylaw better than um, many of us on the ZBA do. So they're important. The landowner, it's their property and we have to respect their what, what their concerns are and uh, how they wish to use it and give some deference to that. In addition, uh, the parties at interest, the abutters and others are affected by the decisions that are, would be made by the ZBA and can affect their life directly and the life of the town, as well as others in the town. So all are important. And the, the question is for the board, how do you balance those out? And that's the process that the board goes through in its deliberation over granting a, 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 an application for special permit or waiver or an appeal to, uh, of a ruling of the building commissioner. So there is no one that overrides them all. It's part of the judgment process that hopefully comes out of the, the five members of the ZBA. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks. Well, I hope that the ZBA encourages all parties to collaborate if they have not done so before a hearing begins. And in fact, I assume that most applicants, if they are um, thinking strategically, do reach out to their butters and other parties ahead of time um, to, to try to have a meeting of the minds before the hearing begins. On video, I have observed discussions of a large project before ZBA that clearly had been revised several times to satisfy neighbors' concerns. And the general tenor of that conversation seemed constructive and not argumentative. But I expect that sometimes an abutter's concerns are not reasonable. And I would not want the abutter to effectively have veto power over someone else's property. I can also imagine, however, a situation where the public's interest is significant because perhaps a public good is being created or modified. Um, the town staff's interest was mentioned and I'm in the question and I'm not sure what interests town staff have other than ensuring that the ZBA is following the law. Um, I would certainly be very reliant on their uh, expertise and guidance. But all that said, and desirable, although it is to have to satisfy everybody, um, it's my belief that our country recognizes and enforces strong property rights, and the zoning bylaw and regulations define the extent of the public's control over private property, and those limits must not be exceeded lest the ZBA or planning board face legal challenge. So if it seems impossible to satisfy all parties' needs and an application can reasonably be said to meet all the legal re requirements, then I think I would lean towards the interest of the property owner. But of course, since I haven't done this yet, I might feel quite differently once the process begins. Thank you. Thank you. And now from John Varner. This is what he wrote. Without specifics, judging whose interests should be given primacy are hard to determine. I believe the quote, health of the environment should be an overarching consideration. Abutters, especially longstanding abutters, often feel they have a tacit level of protection afforded by existing town policies, and that should be given a lot of weight. Infringing on this relationship warrants the most serious of considerations, as it essentially involves the abrogation of a tacit contract between the town and the resident abutters. In some cases, this may be trivial. In some cases, it may be grave. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next question is, what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, dimensional special permits in the zoning bylaw? When should they be used and when should they not be used? So we'll start with Steve and then John and then Sarah. Steve. Um, 
Pete, you're up. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I'm not really sure about the question. Um, waivers, exceptions, and dimensional special permits. You know, I, I, I think of dimensional special permits are something we do all the time. Um, it, it's frequently asked that there is a, a, a pre-existing non-conforming house that sits close to a, a um, the property line and they're asking to make some changes to it or to move something. Um, and you have to permit that uh, continuation of that building even though or maybe extend the, the prop, extend the building along that same line because it makes sense and it doesn't dramatically affect the abutters of the neighborhood. And so you've, you've uh, given a special permit to, to um, um, further violate the dimensional line in the bylaws, but it was something that existed before. Those things happen, and especially in older neighborhoods where you have, uh, have homes and businesses which were uh, plotted a long time ago. And uh, so those are fairly common requests and they're not uniformly granted, but they are considered quickly. We try to consider them quickly. Waivers and exceptions. I'm not really, I'm not really clear what that means. We grant waivers. I, I guess we grant waivers sometimes for requirements in the application to have certain plans, a lighting plan or a parking plan or a, a landscape plan or a management plan. And sometimes we'll grant waivers if it's not really needed. If you're just going to add on something to the back if the lighting is not going to change it's going to be the same we can waive the, we can waive the lighting plan requirement or we can they're not changing landscaping uh, we can waive the landscaping plan requirement so those are kind of case by case i don't see that as a waivers are not a big problem if it, if we need to have the information or if we feel that uh, what they're asking to be waived is essential for the application we won't waive it so um it's just a, it's a judgment call as to whether you're creating a burden an unnecessary burden on the applicant to have them fulfill something that doesn't need to be done. Uh, and I don't really know what the, I'm, I'm not certain what the exception means there. So I, I don't know if that answered your question very well, but in my experience, waivers uh, and uh, dimensional special permits are something we deal with. Thank you, Steve. Yep. John, I think you're up next. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, they're necessary. You know, the, the town of Amherst is almost 300 years old. Um, you know, the, the zoning bylaw, again, you know, exists to give us some guidance, but all, all these projects, as you know, have been said throughout the course of this afternoon, um, you know, have sort of extenuating special circumstances. So waivers, exceptions, and dimensional special permits do come up, um, you know, as Steve has mentioned, we have dealt with them over the past year on a variety of projects, but, you know, it's, it's of course, one-off cases. Um, you know, I, I am... Sort of, uh, of the opinion that you know the goal is not to sort of freely hand these um, let's say dimensional special permits in particular out um, in order to create precedent right because then that sort of goes against the entire um, you know uh, framework of of the zoning board of appeals you know we don't want to create precedent through projects um, that go against um, you know the, the zoning uh, law itself so these these things are very necessary again especially considering the age of the town um the lot dimensions to a lot of these properties um you know just zoning changes over time but you know the goal is again not to create um you know an overarching precedent um in in these projects themselves it, it should always be sort of approached case by case and um this gives us a little bit of flexibility to um to deal with these extenuating circumstances Thank you, John. And Sarah? Um, it's sensible for a zoning bylaw to allow for waivers and exceptions and to require special permits because the bylaw cannot efficiently spell out every possible real world zoning, land use, and construction issue and how to resolve each one. But it is also smart for the zoning bylaw to be quite specific about when an owner can apply for a waiver or exception, what can be waived, and to be specific about the limits of the ZBA's power to grant those exceptions. And where the zoning bylaw does not spell out the decision criteria, the decision still must enhance the public health and welfare and cannot conflict with the general goals of the bylaw. So if a waiver is lawful and the board is persuaded that it has merit, then it can be granted. 
but not set precedent. Thank you, Chair. For John. And John Varner wrote, please refer to my answers to questions four and five. <laughs> okay, right I think Thank it's... You. <laughs> okay, um, I have a short question and I think you know, we'll start with Sarah this time and then to John Gilbert and to um, and then to Steve. So the question is, what is your approach to incorporating public input into your decision-making? Well, I hope that I would have an open mind and be willing to be swayed by arguments made by the public. And I hope that the board can recognize and respond to comments, even if dialogue during meetings isn't permitted, because sometimes members of the public feel that their comments go into a black hole and are ignored, when in fact they are, in fact, they are considered. In the case of specific applications to the ZBA, I can imagine that public comment can be very helpful, very useful in adding additional information and perspectives about the pros and cons of the existing condition and the possible impacts of the changes being sought. But in the end, the ZBA, at least for special permits, needs to make numerous explicit findings in order to issue a permit. And if the findings are met, it is perhaps, again, I don't have the experience to be sure, but perhaps obliged to issue that permit even over objections of other parties. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, John, we'll go to you next. Sure, thank you. Yeah, you have to, you know, you have to recognize the comments, the public input, you have to sort of consider them and weigh the specific feedback against what the general project intent is, as well as, again, what the zone bylaw itself um, sort of gives us some power uh, to allow for. So, you know, I think there's like, again, a common theme through a lot of these uh, responses that, you know, there's a lot of different parties that, um, you know, come into these projects through the built environment. It's not simply developers, it's not simply architects, it's, um, you know, community members, town members, uh, members of the board, et cetera. And because these projects have like a propensity um, to sort of, you know, encroach on a lot of people's um, sort of opinions, it's important to hear them out and do our best, um, you know, as members of the media, of course, to incorporate that feedback um, where applicable in a way that helps drive the projects forward. And at least, you know, in my experience over the past year serving on the CBA, I've I've seen that um, process actually carried out pretty effectively. Um, you know, a butters, neighbors, um, just people within the neighborhood in general, perhaps not immediately abutting the project site, have been able to provide, in some cases, some pretty useful feedback. And, you know, we have seen, um, we as in members of the ZBA, have seen the developers actually incorporate that into project changes. And, and that's sort of where, um, you know, the public private role is able to actually meet in the middle. And, and, you know, in my opinion, that's where the most successful development comes because people feel as though their opinions are you know, sort of being heard and uh, have more, you know, of course, that's not always going to be the case, but by, you know, again, recognizing and giving some space to these differences of opinion is really the first step in um, you know, addressing them and potentially incorporating them in project changes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Steve. Thank you. Um, you know, this really goes to the point of, of the deliberation of the council and of the, of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And that's really what we're empowered to do and what you want us to do is to take various issues and various interests, hear them all, and then um, make our decision based on what's best for the town, consistent with the zoning bylaw. So my, in, in, as chairman of the, of the ZBA, I do a couple of things to make sure that the public's comments are, um, are considered. The first thing is I make sure to read every public comment before the, the board meeting. Sometimes that's a lot of them. As you as, as council members know, um, this is not a town that is shy in expressing its, its opinion. And they're very good. They, they're with, almost without exception, they, they lend some kind of light to the project that um, we may not have thought of. 
So every one of those is, is read. Everyone is, is noted at the meeting so that the public knows of the other public comments. And then, and I think most of my board members, um, most members, my fellow board members, uh, do the same thing. Secondly, we make sure to have public comments whenever there is, a, a, we're, when we're in a public hearing uh, set up and we set time aside for that. And then the response from the applicant to those comments is made to the board, not, it's not a, a direct discussion with the, uh, the public commenter, but they're given a chance to respond. In that way, we get to try to evaluate the public comment against what the applicant says directly, and that helps us make our decisions based upon the public comment and the, the response of the applicant. So I think it's really important. Um, it is really important to make sure that people feel what I think it all, what this all points to is you need to have the ZBA have legitimacy in the town. And the way that has to happen is we have to do our job well. That means we have to understand the bylaw. We have to work within the bylaw. We have to give space, as John said, to public comment. And we have to evaluate all those and come up with a decision that makes sense. And that gives us the validity uh, in the eyes of the public to continue to do our job. If we don't do that, um, we're, not, we're not serving the, the good of the town. And that's what we're there for. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, and Mandy, to read John oh. Varner's? John Varner's response. He wrote, public input should be of paramount importance and should be encouraged as much as possible. The town belongs to all its residents, not one individual or one small group or another with some vested interest. While individual citizens must take responsibility to stay informed, adequate time and notice should be given and made as publicly known and available as possible. It's my turn. <laughs> it's my turn again, and yeah. I'm going to be starting with Steve. Um, what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the ZBA, Steve? Um, you know, I don't want to be glib, but I think I referred to it earlier. I've I've done this for five years. I think you know my, or you, you could know my record um, on the on the board, and um, I think the board has worked pretty well. Um, I've over the last couple of years. It's been extremely difficult with uh, with Zoom as opposed to in-person. And that requires a, requires a, um, additional effort to try to gather um, collegiality, consensus, because we need to have four votes for most, four out of five votes for most things. So you need to have close to consensus. And I think we've done that um, pretty successfully. Um, not everybody agrees with every issue, but if we have more than one person that doesn't agree on a special permit, we can't approve it. So, um, and we've been successfully approving the special permits um, with the conditions on it that we thought were important. So I think the, I think the board has run well over the last couple of years and I, and I can foresee it continuing to run well. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, and I'm gonna go to John. Thanks. Yeah, I don't wanna, you know, reiterate too much of what you know, has already been said, but um, you know, having served on the ZBA for the past year, I think I've, you know, been able to develop like a pretty keen insight into competing interests uh, within the town. And you know, that's a pretty valuable uh, trait to you know, pull forward, hence my interest in you know, also renewing here. Through my professional career as an architect, you know, I've worked on projects of all scopes and scales. So while Amherst is, you know, uh, quite unique in the variety of the projects that come through, there is still a variety of projects. And, you know, I like to think that at least my professional background has benefited me in being able to have some flexibility in um, analyzing and providing some feedback, um, you know, as my role as a board member, um, based on, you know, uh, different scales and, and sort of scopes of projects that have passed through the ZBA. Um, I've lived in Amherst on and off for, I think, six years, something to that degree now, both during my time in architecture, uh, also a recent graduate from Eisenberg, uh, did my MBA. So, you know, Amherst has held a special place in my heart, even with uh, a lot of bouncing around and living in Boston and the like. And, you know, from my perspective, being able to provide, um, you know, some value to guiding um, you know, thoughtful, long-term uh, oriented development throughout the town is, you know, is really what I um, want to bring and, and feel at least I've been able to offer for the past year and um, you know, be grateful to continue to do that in the future. Thank you, John. 
Sarah? Yes. My professional work has always been science related in one form or another. My training and work as a scientist, teacher and consultant always centered attention to detail, objectivity, questioning and weighing of evidence. These habits of mind will be useful to me if I'm appointed in a role where so much critical review and thoroughness are needed. Thank you. Mandy? I will read John Varner's response. Um, he writes, I believe my 30 years as an Amherst resident and property owner and my rich employment history and association memberships give me an in-depth perspective and a broad set of skills to bring to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, I spent several years as an employee of the National Park Service, giving me a deep appreciation of the need to respect and conserve natural resources. I worked for a few years in biotech, first in a startup in Amherst, and then as one of the firm's employees in the Worcester Biotech Park. I have several years experience as a builder and remodeler, having built several houses in the area and remodeled commercial locations in Amherst, Northampton, Hadley, and Montague. Finally, I have been an acupuncturist, now semi-retired, working in a private practice and in the employment of Bay State Pain Management Center in Springfield for 20 years. In addition to my work history, I have served in several organizations in various roles of governance. I was a member of the Board of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine Society of Massachusetts for many fractious years. While we sought insurance and licensure reforms, I was an Amherstown meeting member for six years. I was a union shop steward at UMass during the period I took graduate courses there, and I am currently co-director and studio manager for the Mud Pie Pottery Collective Studio at Leverett Crafts and Arts Center. In these capacities, I have maintained a stance of principled idealism while seeking realistic solutions to a wide variety of problems. That brings us to me asking the last question. Please answer this question, yes or no. Um, please confirm that you have the time to commit to meetings, hearings, and site visits. John Gilbert. Yes. Thank you. Sarah Marshall. Yes. Steve Judge. Yep. And John Varner writes, yes, as a self-employed and semi-retired individual, I have time and energy for this position. I believe that ends our interviews. I want to thank um, all three of our applicants um, for coming to the interviews today and sitting with us for the interviews. I know two of you have a meeting that starts in 40 minutes. So I appreciate you uh, being willing to come early um, in order to stay on Zoom and then go back to that meeting. Um, what will happen is after, after I finish this, um, we will remove you from the panelist section of this meeting. You're welcome to stay, although we will not be going directly into discussions at this time um, because we have some stuff from the planning department that needs heard and they want to discuss it before the ZBA meeting at six. So we're trying to get them through before the recommendations. So we're actually going to do that before we go back to as a CRC group discussing um, the interviews, the applications, and making recommendations to the town council. Um, when those are made, um, I will try to remember to email all of you tonight. Um, I failed in that last time and remembered just before the meeting, but I do my best to notice, notify all applicants about the motions that were made and the votes um, so that they know ahead of time before the council meeting what the what might be going on at the council meeting. So I will do my best to do that tonight. Um, if we make recommendations tonight, if we do make recommendations at today's meeting, we will, they will be on the council agenda for action on Monday's council meeting. Um, and that, that would, if, if votes are that done there, then any appointments made would become effective um, July 1, because that's, and things are there. Are there any questions before we move on in our meeting? Seeing none, thank you all again for taking the time out to come and interview and make it through this process. Um, and while I've got Steve and John here, thank you for your service for the past number of years on the ZBA. And Sarah, thank you for your service on the CPA committee. And I think it was recreation that puts you on CPA. Um, so, um, you know, we, we appreciate all of our residents that are willing to take time to serve, serve the town. So thank you all. And we're going to move on to our next agenda item now. So Athena, can you please move thank Sarah, you. Don and Steve to the uh, attendee section?
And once they are all moved, um, we will move on to what we're going to go with um, is I think we've got everyone, Rob and Ben and Chris and Maureen and Dave, Robin, Robin, Dave, um, if they don't start their videos, I'm going to have someone try and I think they're both in town hall right now. Um, there's Rob's <laughs> and, and I can, if, if Dave doesn't show up soon, we'll, we'll get him started too. Um, we're going to move on to the proposal to make permanent certain aspects of zoning bylaw article 14. There is a PowerPoint in your packet, uh, I believe, I don't know who it is, Ben or Maureen or Rob, someone's going through that, if not all three of you are um, today. And so I think we've got everyone moved. Um, so yeah, let's get started because I know Maureen and Rob, you guys have that six o'clock meeting, maybe Ben does too, to go to too. So we're on a time limit here. <laughs> so who's starting? Um, I'm gonna get started. Thanks, Mandy. Um, Unless Chris or Rob, did you have any introduction to make? Okay. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I'll put the PowerPoint up. So, oops. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk to you about Article 14. Um, as you all know, Article 14 is a temporary zoning article that was put into effect during the COVID pandemic. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of the, the impact that Article 14 has had, um, its success, and then uh, some, and then Maureen is gonna talk about our proposal to make aspects of Article 14 permanent. So yeah, just presentation outline, I'm gonna give a little bit of background um, and then talk about next steps. So just a little bit of background to start. Um, Article 14 was put into effect, I don't know the exact date, but early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, obviously Amherst was severely impacted economically by the um, COVID pandemic, students uh, leaving Amherst, and it really had a big impact on our downtown restaurants, especially. So the um, Article 14 was put into effect as a way to both expedite um, new businesses entering downtown or entering town, um, but also to easily allow the expansion of new businesses uh, to include, you know, outdoor dining, for example, or to expand their footprint. Um, this, the, the, the way this was done by was by the relaxing of zoning requirements um, and to allow certain uses uh, to be done, to be approved administratively rather than by site plan review or special permit. Um, Article 14 has been extended, uh, I think, at least twice um, since it was first put into place. However, it expires uh, in six months on December 31st, 2022. And I think it was this body, the CRC, that expressed a desire to not extend it further, but to make aspects of it permanent, uh, which is why we're here today. Um, you know, I think Rob can speak to this a bit more. There haven't been any issues that have arisen out of these administrative approvals. Um, it's been applauded by the business community um, and we haven't had really any issues with uh, the administrative approval. And so brings me to my last point, which is there's interest from the CRC, which we've heard, uh, town staff, and certainly the Amherst business community in continuing these uh, aspects of Article 14. Um, so we're gonna talk just brief today about um, the nuts and bolts about how that could happen. Um, here's just a little bit more about the purpose of why we want to do this. Um, you know, we think by streamlining some of the permitting processes, it processes that could reduce uh, cost and permitting requirements for businesses that are the really the core of our downtown. Uh, we want to encourage business owners to consider relocating to Amherst or, or locating in Amherst. Um, you know, the bid and chamber support these efforts, but, and so we're wanting to support them as well. And really, you know, we have decades of uh, experience as a town permitting and approving um, restaurants, whether through site plan review or special permit or administratively. So we have a lot of practice uh, and procedures for doing this. And so we have kind of this list of standard conditions that we put on that are put on these types of applications. So we're looking to build off of that experience um, to, to make 
more streamlined uh, processes. Um, and then, la and uh, so that's, you know, that last point is to just make sure that if we are gonna make things uh, more streamlined that they're properly conditioned and have the right standards and conditions attached to those approvals as well. So just a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how this could happen. And this is also a little bit overview of the presentation to come. So planning staff, uh, we've been looking at just a review of the status, or I guess the, the pre-COVID days, how things uh, were permitted before Article 14. Um, so we're gonna review the permit pathway for the food and drink establishments um, and, and then how they're, to, how they're classified. Um, and then Maureen's going to discuss, discuss uh, the reclassification of food and drink establishments, some changes to the permitting pathways and standards and conditions that we might consider. And so currently, um, the zoning bylaw, this, um, the current use categories that we have for restaurants, or I guess food and drink establishments, we have really three categories. There's class one which are restaurants, cafes, lunchroom, cafeteria, or similar places. Um, so these are class one restaurants, um, and these are permitted by site plan review in all commercial and business districts. Um, class two restaurants um, are permitted by special permit in all business and commercial districts. And really the difference between class one and class two difference, uh, between class one and class two restaurants is, is that class one restaurants close before 1130. Um, and there might be more to it, but that's really one of the, the major differences is that distinguishes the class one and two restaurants. And then lastly, we have class three restaurants, we, uh, which are drive up only. Uh, we don't have very many of those, if, if any. Um, they're in the commercial district only and they're permitted by special permit. So we're mainly focusing on class one and two restaurants today. Um, and we're gonna make some proposals for how we could better define and classify restaurants rather than just based on the hours of operation really. Um, and so this, you know, to my next point, the, the way we currently classify food and drink establishments is really based on their hours of operation whether it's open past 11.30 or not, whether alcohol is served or not. And then there are some considerations for uh, a pro proximity to residential zoning districts. I think it's 150 feet. Uh, you're held to a higher standard if you're in that pro proximity to a residential zoning district. Um, so now I'm gonna ask Maureen to... Chime in, I know you have to go soon for the ZBA meeting. But... Yeah, um, do you mind um, switching to the different slides for me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, thanks, ev uh, thanks everyone. Um, so um, we propose to consider uh, reclassifying um, the food and drink establishments uh, based on a variety of factors. Um, that are um, um, including the intensity of the use, uh, queuing lines outside, um, how people wait in line to, to get into like a restaurant or a bar, noise levels, as well as, as um, uh, whether food is served or not and uh, the capacity load of how many people would be in a restaurant at any given time. And so we um, are uh, looking at one, two, three, four, four different um, use types. Uh, the first one would be a restaurant, a cafe, or a bar, any sort of you know restaurant or bar like um, place that serves food at all times of operation. And uh, we want to uh, consider further, uh, ha um, have further consideration of really small establishments in existing buildings that have, um, 20 seats or less or a number around that. And that uh, would be, you know, um, you know, classic places like MoMA or glazed donuts or the, the once glazed donuts that we had um, and, you know, Arigato and, and, and small restaurants um, like that. Uh, we would like to have a use, um, the, 
to um, consider having a use classification just for those small um, sorts of restaurants in existing buildings and to um, have a use uh, for bars that don't serve food or um, just have very minimum prepackaged food and or, and or allow takeout food. Uh, some examples would include like Mon and Dove, they have peanuts that people can grab and bring back to the table. Um, the spoke allows um, folks to bring in uh, takeout food, which I actually just learned of. And um, uh, the Drake has uh, bagged popcorn uh, for people going to shows. Uh, there. And, and then uh, another classification we're looking at is uh, nightclubs as uh, defined by the building code and some typical factors of a, like a nightclub to distinguish like a nightclub versus like a restaurant or a bar is that um, nightclubs have low uh, lighting levels. They have loud music, a dense amount of uh, occupants that are usually standing or dancing uh, and not there's hardly any tables if if any at all. And um, they have um, typical door opening times, such as like when the nightclub opens and then at the end of the night when everyone wants to leave. Um, and then um, the, the last uh, use that we're looking at is any of the above food and drink establishments with more than 250 occupants allowed. Um, and so those would be geared towards um, larger, larger capacity places uh, opposed to, you know, smaller, smaller restaurants. Um, and, you know, there are typically restaurants in Amherst that we've done some preliminary research is, you know, there are, there um, are majority of restaurants that are less than 200, um, but there are some out there that are uh, more than 250, such as like the hangar is a good example um, on University Drive. I, th I think the capacity there, it might be even over 400. So that's a, a big, big capacity. If you go to the next slide. And so we want to consider changes um, to the standards and conditions for each of those proposed use types that we indicated in the last slide in the zoning bylaw. So the current uh, standards and conditions under the zoning bylaw for the, um, the existing uses, the class one, the class two, and the class three restaurants are very limiting. Um, there's not a lot of um, information or requirements um, for these use types. And it could be could be um, expanded to make the process uh, more clear, predictable, and coordinated and timely, which would be really beneficial both for the applicant, so like a restaurateur, or uh, for like the ZBA or the planning board or the building commissioner. They would know precisely really what, what are the, the big factors that need to be or, or, or criteria that needs to be fulfilled in order for a restaurant to or bar to open. And so bit by bit, the you know the ZBA and the planning board have gradually built a set of effective boilerplate conditions as part of the approved permits. And you know that's been with the assistance of the building commissioner and the and planning staff. Um, and it's worked really well. Um, and we've built um, these um, boilerplate conditions over several years. So based on every decision we write, we expand it a little more, it gets evolved a little more and it gets better and better and better. But we wanna have a consistent uh, criteria that would be applied to all restaurants or bars um, that want to come into Amherst. So to really formalize, um, formalize that for each of the use types. And we similarly, if you're familiar with the um, the uh, uh, zoning amendment that we went through last year with, with the accessory dwelling units. That was kind of the same process of like, you know, the ZBA may took, um, on a routine basis would, in, uh, uh, would include these boilerplate conditions. And we wanted to say, hey, let's standardize, standardize these criteria and put it in the bylaw so we can make it simpler and more effective for both the applicant and for the town. So um, we see this as a really good opportunity. Next slide. And so um, so we wanna consider allowing like restaurants and bars that serve food to be permitted by uh, site plan review. Um, and so those would be, um, yeah, rest restaurants and, and bars that serve food. And then we want to um, provide further consideration of very small establishments and in, in existing buildings, as, as I mentioned before. Um, 
you know, um, Arigato, a good example, um, that, uh, that had tw 20 seats or less, or, um, or Pita Pocket, it, it'd be a really good example, places like that. And consider, you know, we uh, consider making those buy right uses that uh, we, um, that would be really helpful and beneficial for the small restaurant owners that are um, just starting off a business and um, and we want to provide much you know support a, as much as we can um, um, through the local government. And then uh, we propose that uh, there'd be a special permit process for bars with no food served um, because um, you know the, the intensity of that use is beginning to change. It's it's bar uh, with with alcohol. There's there might be queuing, there might be noise activity. There might there would definitely need to be like crowd control um, items and ID checking and so things um, of that nature need to be really um, uh, reviewed and to make sure that that use is compatible with the surroundings. So we we would propose that bars with no food would be by special permit review and approval and certainly with nightclubs again now the intensity of that use is expanding even greater more loud music perhaps longer queuing lines outside and so we want really would want to make sure that you know that uh, a nightclub that's being managed properly um and so a site plan review and approval would be um be our recommendation and then establishments with more than 250 occupants allowed for any of the, the above uses mentioned would be also by special permit. So, um, so a restaurant that serves food um, that is a really large restaurant that's you know over 250 uh, occupants, um, or I think maybe um, uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think of an example, but like I guess the hangar would would be an example of that. They mm -hmm. um, of a very large uh, restaurant with a high capacity, which has an increased intensity uh, of use and its in and potential impacts on that surrounding. So having stringent conditions, um, more so than ha uh, than just having um, a, a criteria in the bylaw, we would want to give the discretion to the ZBA to even provide more stringent uh, conditions on a permit to ensure that that um, it would have um, no ill effect to the surrounding. And next slide, let's see here. And so there would be other zoning um, with these um, proposals that we're presenting to you, they would have other um, minor adjustments to the zoning bylaw and procedural changes that would uh, would be sort of the domino effect. So we would need to ar amend article 11 to detail the administrative approval decision and filing with the town clerk. Um, and we would have to consider how to publicly post administrative appli administrative applications and associated approval decisions. So how do we use technology? How do we use the website as a wonderful tool to get the word out to the members of the public about these applications and decisions? We just got this new permitting software called OpenGov and um, it has all bells and whistles. So we think that we could you know, really streamline this process both for the applicant and also for the public to um, notify uh, folks um, in a real transparent way. And then, and then make Article 5 accessory units consistent with per the permitting path for um, restaurants and bars. Um, so we would want to also um, look at what changes would need if any uh, to occur with the seasonal outdoor dining section and for live or pre-recorded entertainment. Um, next slide. And then, so as a summary, art of, um, article 14 has uh, made it clear um, that more uses could be permitted successfully, either administratively or by site plan review. Um, and that Article 14 um, does expire in six months. It seems like a far, uh, seems like far away, but it's really not. It's going to be here in a couple, and before you know it. And so this is a really great opportunity to improve the permit process, both for uh, you know uh, local businesses and restaurants, and for the uh, for the town and, and the public. And you know Amherst's large 
a large student population and recent development will continue to support these establishments in downtown and village centers um, that are close to residential areas. So we want to be as supportive as we can, um, you know, to encourage restaurants to come to town, to encourage people to come down, to visit downtown, to walk downtown, to check out um, retail and, and restaurants. And so this would hopefully be enticing to uh, for restaurants to know that the permit process is going to, you know, be clear and concise and be uh, timely um, and not some, um, you know, uh, complicated, um, lengthy process um, where applicable and trying to find. So we're, you know, we're trying to find a balance and having reasonable oversight and in, into high intensity uses, such as high capacity bars and, and nightclubs and to support um, uh, support economic development in downtown and our village centers. So uh, next steps, we want to, of course, receive feedback and direction from you all from the CRC and from the planning board. Uh, ben and, and I and Rob and Chris will be meeting with the planning board on Wednesday, June 29th, and we'll be giving them this uh, presentation. Um, as well. So we want to get their feedback and we want to provide a draft proposed uh, changes to to section 3.3, .3, um, the use classifications and standards. That's where all the uses are um, indicated. So like, um, so we would want to put the, you know, the, the different uh, new uh, restaurant types in, into that and see how that would look and to um, uh, propose criteria uh, for each of those uses and, and to draft minor related amendments to Article 5 and to 11. So Article 5 is for those accessory uses, the outdoor dining and the live entertainment and Article 11 is for administrative approvals. So those would need to have minor uh, modifications as well. And we hope to return back to the CRC and to the planning board with draft amendments in form of the zoning bylaw in early September. And I think, thank you. So Ben and I, um, I need to go in about six minutes, but Ben can stay mm -hmm. for as long as you need. Oh him. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to open again. it up to questions from, um, or before we do questions, Rob or Chris, do you want to add anything into that before we, before I open it up to questions from the CRC members? I don't have anything to say. Um, Rob is more familiar with this whole topic because he's been working with the CBA on the, um, particularly the class two restaurants. So he may have something to say. I do not have anything to say. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, um, comments from CRC members? Pat. I think that uh, this is a really good idea um, to make uh, Article 14 the uh, permanent. Uh, I, it's really worked during COVID and decisions have been excellent by the staff and I see no reason not to go ahead with what you're thinking about. Uh, Jennifer. Um, I agree with Pat. I think it, um, what is it like necessity is the mother of invention? It seems like, uh, you know, COVID helped this to happen and it got us to um, actually a good place. But I did just have a question, just more curiosity. It said that the reclassification for food and drink establishments would apply in an existing building. And that's because if it's a new construction, it, the usage isn't necessarily gonna have to get a special permit, but the building, is that, is that why existing building was spelled out? Or would, it said um, food and drink establishments in an existing building would be by site plan review. So I guess my question is, if it's a new building, then it's a special permit because the building's being built even, but it's not that the restaurant itself is gonna have to go through. Does that make sense? And then Maureen? Uh, sure, so I can try to help uh, explain this. So we're proposing, so restaurants and bars that serve food um, would be by site plan review and 
Um, and so that would be for regardless of if that would be for new construction. Um, and, you know, we do currently and we would like to maintain the ability for redevelopment projects. So like um, when Garcia's uh, took over, I'll always call it for Tucci's, when it uh, took over for Tucci's, um, that was a redevelopment project. And so they actually, uh, and I believe they just needed to make up some modifications to the doors and the windows and the signage. And so um, they, uh, uh, if that's, uh, and I, uh, they, uh, they would have seeked a site plan review waiver if COVID didn't exist. Um, but because of um, COVID, um, they, I believe they went for Article 14, but in, in normal circumstances, that would be the process. And so we all, and then on top of that, we want to further consider for very small restaurants and existing buildings to allow those by right. Um, because we want to support the, you know, the development in town that's, it's already there, that the, these restaurant spaces are already, already ready to go. But, you know, as different parts of town, you know, along University Drive, uh, you know, by the East Village, uh, by like Spirit House, you know, you might start seeing some of these buildings be, you know, you know, demolished and rebuilt. And so we would want to make sure that that um, new restaurants, um, regardless if they're really small or if they're, you know, a hundred capacity, that those sorts would be by site plan review because those will have new impacts to traffic and and to the surroundings. So we so the buy right would really be just for small establishments and existing buildings. So if so, whatever goes uh, takes over glazed donuts, for instance. Um, that would be a site plan review waiver, but under our proposal, that would be under uh, a buy right use. So what happened with um, Humble Peach? I'm just curious. They're open. Uh, I no, believe no, that was, was that under it? Article 14. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Melanie. Yeah, I totally support this. And I just want to make a comment and then I have a question. The comment is that I think these small changes really make a big difference. For example, even the small change we made in accessory dwelling unit last in the last TRC. And I just heard in our neighborhood, there's a new couple that chose to come to Amherst and not East Hampton because we have better accessory dwelling unit bylaw. So I just want to commend all of you that all the changes that you're making, you know, they really have a direct impact in bringing in families and hopefully with this bringing in small businesses. And there are a lot of minority and small businesses that are trying to open up. So here's my question that what I've heard, and obviously I haven't done a systematic study or anything, but I've just heard that the online program has been a little difficult to navigate, especially if a person you know, for that where English is a second language. So what has been your experience with the online permitting and especially with the people of color, I mean, people who have second language and it, what would be a support you can offer for people who can't navigate that online system? Um, Rob? So we've um, we've actually received really positive feedback for the for the system, uh, you know, so far, uh, you know, uh, it makes applications really convenient, renewals really fast, uh, establishes good communication and, uh, you know, generates a discussion electronically that, you know, can occur a lot quicker. So we've had a lot of good positive um, feedback from it so far. It's not necessarily used for the first application. So a new establishment, you know, really does need to contact the office. Uh, you know, for example, the the bid, uh, the chamber contacted me last week because they had a uh, an individual in their office that wanted to uh, talk about starting a restaurant. And, you know, I told them they really need to come in and, and meet with us. And we have a position here, a permit administrator. Uh, so it's it's something that is because it touches on health licensing, uh, you know, building permitting potentially and fire regulations. 
uh, you know, somebody would really have to be well experienced to use the electronic system for that. So it's really geared for renewal and processing large numbers of applications. So we staff is here. We are communicating more than we ever had with the bid in the chamber on these these matters. And I know they're going to have some technical assistance funding available and uh, they don't hesitate to contact our office to uh, start discussing the specifics of a property. So I think that's really what we have to continue to do. Thank you. Um, my question, uh, you're, it's going to be sound similar to everyone else. I would I support all of this in terms of you know moving as much of the food and drinks to special permits, site plan reviews, and then allowing them for the administrative waivers or um, also just by right uses um, because we've seen it working well through COVID. And the one question I have, which doesn't relate to this presentation at all, um, was when we first discussed this back in January or February about making things permanent. One thing, Rob, you had said was temporary uses that really there, that doesn't exist in the bylaw right now. Um, that wasn't discussed here. I don't know whether that's because you have just haven't brought that to us um, and you're still considering it and you were focusing on food and drink right now um, because, you know, or for some other reason. So I, I'm just curious as to with the temporary uses in terms of kiosks, um, you know, the farm facilities you, you talked about, I think farm that wants to offer wedding or music event type uses um, and that we don't really have a permitting pathway for them right now other than article 14 what's going on with that is that going to come to us also by september so that we don't lose that if we don't extend top um article 14 rob yes uh we are working on that uh you know uh very much so just as much as uh article 14 the planning staff has secured a grant working with the pioneer valley planning commission on parts of that uh, you know, some of that will overlap with things like, um, you know, how to possibly consider uh, small scale breweries or distilleries or wineries. Uh, so that's that's part of another project that's very active and going on. I don't know if it's going to be something that'll be ready for September. It might be later in the year, uh, just from what I've seen. And certainly Ben, I know Ben's very much involved with that. If he's got a, any thoughts on that. Uh, but um, really important. I'd like to see it continue and, you know, hope that we'll have uh, some, some draft language for that in the coming months as well. Excellent. And I forgot, I had one other question, which is that split at 250. Um, I don't know what capacity the new Garcia's has or what Bertucci's had, um, but that went into an existing building and under the sort of plan you just put forward, that would still require a special permit because it would be over 250. Um, and so is there a way to, if they're over 250, but going into an existing building that had the similar use, like, is there a way to maybe make that easier to permit than having to go through a special permit again um, type thing? Because it looks like under the current plan, they'd still have to go to special permit, even though, it, you know, I think Garcia's was permitted under temporary zoning article 14 and it doesn't seem to have been a problem. Um, again, existing building, right? And I think that's one of the concern, you know, one of the defining characteristics of things that could go through either administrative approval or not is existing building similar use to prior use. Yeah, so we, we actually only have one establishment that's over 250, that's the, the hangar. Uh, they have a occupant load of 388. Uh, the next highest document load is the Bistro 63 Monkey Bar. Uh, full capacity is 240. Uh, and then we go down from there. But, you know, Garcia's and Johnny's and a, a number of other establishments are, you know, right in the high 100, 190, 180 area. Um, but I think what would happen is that, you know, it really depends on how the special permit is conditioned. So the zoning board uh, in the past, you know, they've handled it a couple of different ways. When a permit is issued for a food establishment, it may expire and, you know, end with that current owner, or it could continue with uh, updating management plans and um, the just kind of new information. So I, I think it would depend on how big of a change the new business would be making. Uh, 
uh, certainly if it's a, you know, Garcia's gets bought, change the name, but it's the exact same kind of configuration. Uh, you know, we would give the opportunity to that business owner to just, um, you know, show us that their management plan satisfies all the requirements of the initial permit. And that's something the zoning board is used to, but um, yeah, it's something we'll, we'll consider as we kind of put the, the classifications into the bylaw form. Yes. Any other questions from CRC members? Seeing none, I want to thank uh, Rob and Ben and Maureen and Chris um, for bringing this to us um, and updating us on the status. I think we're all looking forward to seeing the language and being able to, to make sure that what has worked during COVID isn't lost um, and that we've learned from that and, and move on from there with, with changes that we'll be able to continue without us having to renew them on a yearly basis. <laughs> So um, we're going to go at this point back to um, action item 4A, um, which is the ZBA appointments discussion of interviews and applications of applicants to the ZBA and then a recommendation vote potentially. Um, so um, before we talk about the applicants, I just want to summarize sort of where we are on this, um, which is there are two impending vacancies or vacancies for full membership, so, so members. Um, the ZBA is one of the only boards that has members and associate members, and so two of the members who are current applicants, their terms are expiring June 30. Um, and so we have those two vacancies coming up. We also have ZBA allows for four associate memberships and those are one year terms, not three year terms. So they, everyone that's appointed to an associate membership has to reapply every year if they want to continue. Um, but we are looking to appoint four every year to that. Um, as people saw, we interviewed three applicants and then there was one applicant who could not make the interviews that application, the CAF was filed after we'd set the interview deadline um, and the applicant could not make it. I offered that applicant not any promises. I will be clear about that. Um, I did not promise anything, but I said, um, I said what you could potentially try and I don't know what CRC will do is submit an SOI to remain an applicant, submit answers to the written written answers to the questions since we'd already adopted the interview questions, and then I will bring it to the CRC. It is not a policy we can um, waive because it's a council policy that's been adopted that flat out says in um, section nine interviews that app, uh, in residents who do not attend the interviews will not be considered applicants and will not be considered for appointment. That is the council policy. So we can't um, consider them as an applicant necessarily. Um, what we could do is make a recommendation to the town council to waive that the council waive that requirement of their policy for a particular applicant, and then make a recommendation that if that requirement is waived, that such applicant may be appointed. Um, so we'll deal with that applicant last <laughs> because of those those issues. Um, what I will say, uh, not everyone was on CRC last year. Last year, it was not a council policy. It was a CRC policy that everyone attended inter interviews. And last year, there was one person who um, applied to the ZBA that could not attend the interview that CRC moved to waive its policy for and then moved to appoint, recommend appointment for that person to the ZBA. The situation was slightly different. That person had applied to planning board and did attend the interviews for the planning board. And then when they were not appointed to the planning board, um, CRC had, had directed me as chair to reach out to every applicant who was not recommended for appointment to the planning board to see if they would like to serve on ZBA. This person said yes, but they couldn't attend the interview for the ZBA. They had attended the, the interview for the uh, planning board. So we had actually, as a CRC group, seen them at an interview. But 
based on that situation is why I offered this potential option to this applicant, Mr. Varner, because we had done something similar in the past, although it's not an equation. So saying all of that, there are a couple motions we need to do immediately. Um, I'm gonna start with two of them and then we will discuss the three applicants that interviewed and then we will discuss the one that did not attend the interview. So I'm just gonna make the motion for the first set of motions, which is of, of the four people whose terms are expiring, two are applicants. I'm not gonna make a motion for them right now, but two are not. Yet they are currently sitting on ZBA applications and hearings for those applications. What we do is we always recommend that their terms be extended solely for those applications. Um, so that they can continue to sit on those applications until those applications are completed and votes are done and whatever is signed. Otherwise, it creates problems because ZBA, their regulations, state law requires that the same members sit for the entire hearing. So if they're not members of ZBA, they lose them. And so we do. So I'm going to make that motion. It is a motion we did last year too for those it worked well and that is a move to recommend that the town council appoint the following residents to the zba the zoning board of appeals associate member effective july 1 2022 for a term expiring at the conclusion of action on the matter of zba fy 2022-13 karen winter extension of term to complete hearing on which member is serving and associate member effective July 1, 2022 for a term expiring at the conclusion of action on the matter of ZBA FY 2022-14, Eric Cochrane, extension of term to complete hearing on which member is serving. Is there a second? Second. second. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> we'll give that one to Jennifer. Pat can have the next one. <laughs> Any discussion on this? Seeing none, I'm going to take a vote. Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. Jennifer. Aye. So that is four, that is unanimous with one absent. Um, okay. So now we move on to the three applicants. We have um, John Gilbert, Steve Judge, and Sarah Marshall. Um, depending on what we decide for them depends on whether what motion I will make because two of them are currently on the ZBA and sitting on four or five different hearings. So we're ready to make motions to extend terms for hearings, but we may not need to make those motions depending on what we recommend regarding everyone else. <laughs> so that's why we only did the associates that were not seeking further terms because what we do with the rest. So thoughts on, let, let's go with just quick thoughts on all the applicants and then thoughts on positions. So Jennifer. So I'm, I, what I wanted to say is I had got a text from Pam. So this is that she tried to call in and couldn't, and she couldn't email you, Mandy, because her computer lost power and she had my phone number. So she texted me. <laughs> um, and I don't, so I don't, she just, she texted what her vote would be. I don't know. I'll save that till the end. I don't know if she can even Let, vote let's remotely. Let's save that to the end. Okay, um, I just wanted to tell you, you I had say, it and she tried to get through to you. Do you want to say anything um, regarding the three applicants? Um, well, I uh, I thought they're, you know, we're all gave thorough responses. Um, I guess just to cut to the chase, um, I would be partial for um, reappointing the two that currently serve on the board and then offering, you know, Sarah an associate. I mean, I think that the, the two that are currently serving um, would provide good continuity moving forward. Um, I have always found uh, Steve Judge not that I've sat in on that many ZBA meetings, but extremely measured, fair, calm, judicious. Um, I have to say he, I, I ran into him once on the street and I said, oh, the 
uh, LHD just granted a certificate of appropriateness to such and such, and they'll be coming before the ZBA. And he said, don't say one more word to me. He goes, I don't like to know anything ahead of time. <laughs> so he's really takes that uh, very seriously. Um, I, I, I'm, well, I'm jumping ahead. I, personally, I'm, I, um, I appreciated some of the, the answers of John Varner. I would be comfortable with him being on the board, but I know that, that that's a whole, you know, um, and so this is where I do feel a, a little uncomfortable because I don't want to disparage anybody, but um, I've recently sat in on two ZBA meetings, about six hours of meetings. And I was, you know, paying attention to John Gilbert. I mean, I just thought, well, I don't know him at all. You know, this would be a chance just to, you know, get a sense of how, um, you know, how, you know, not just conduct himself, but kind of, you know, what, um, you know, just to have a better sense of, of how um, his, you know, he handles the position with this. And I was struck that in the six hours of meetings, um, he asked one question. So I didn't find him as maybe engaged as I had hoped to. So that's, you know, but I, you know, he, you know, certainly, um, you know, has the qualifications to be on the board. So I would say that. Thanks. Um would anyone else like to make comments before I make some comments? Well, I'll make mine. Um, as with many applications that we see here, everyone is eminently qualified, um, which is always a good problem to have. Um, you know, and so, you know, as with Jennifer, I, I support um, Steve and John as members and then Sarah as associate members. It's clear that Steve and John have full knowledge. Um, I worry that if we don't reappoint either to a, to a full membership, we might lose them completely. And I don't want to do that, especially since we have such a small pool. Um, I also, in, in seeing, listening to Steve's answers, uh, he spent one year as an associate and then has been on for four years. So I do recognize that our reappointment policy, this puts him over that six years. Um, but it does not put him over by much. It puts him over by one year because associates are different than full members. Um, but what I what struck me was I think that years associate, then the membership, you can just see how much there's there. And I think Sarah could would would learn similarly, would be fantastic in that. Um, that that slow sort of entry into all of those regulations so that you're not sitting on five or six hearings at a time, you're starting with one or two potentially over the course of a year. I think that would, um, given the learning curve that we know she's going to have, and I know she's going to be fantastic at doing that learning curve, there's no question about that, that the dedication is there, that um, an associate at this point seems um, more appropriate in my mind for that, given who else we have applying for the roles. Um, so that, that's sort of where I stand um, on those three. Any other comments? And if not, I'm just gonna make some motions. <laughs> I see some noddings of heads of motions. Um, Jennifer, did you want to add in what Pam was thinking um, for those three people there? She obviously can't vote because she's not at the meeting, but, but what are her thoughts on those three? Exactly where you come out. Okay. Um, with that, I'm just going to make the motion, which is, and this is going to be two separate motions. Move to recommend that the town council reappoint Steve Judge and John Gilbert as full members to the Zoning Board of Appeals for terms effective July 1, 2022 and ending June 30, 2025. Is there a second? Second. That motion is moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we're starting with Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. That is unanimous with Pam absent, but Pam, according to Jennifer, um, would have voted yes if she could have had enough power to attend this meeting. Um, 
The next motion is moved to recommend that the town council appoint Sarah Marshall as associate member to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a term effective July 1, 2022 and ending June 30, 2023. Is there a second? Second, Shalini. Shalini seconds that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we're going to start with Mandy. Mandy's an aye. Jennifer? Aye. Um, Shalini? Yes. And Pat? Aye. That is also four to zero with one absent. Um, next, we need to discuss John Varner. And the first one is, does this committee believe we should recommend to the town count that the town council waive section nine interviews of the town council policy on making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies? That is the title of the policy um, for Mr. Varner, um, because that policy, if we do not waive it, he cannot be considered an applicant. Jennifer. Yes, I be, well, I, I believe it's maybe helpful to know, I think he was out of the country and out of range. So it wasn't just that it wasn't convenient. Um, and, you know, I think it's hard when we, it, they're only offered one time for the interview. Um, so I don't, I, I think he would have made every effort to be here if he possibly could have. So I, I would um, support waiving or, or recommending to the council that be waived. Shalini. I think, yeah, I, I think that we need to be flexible and make every effort to accommodate, which I think we did in terms of getting his um, responses in writing. Um, but given that he wasn't going to be there, did he give the responses before knowing that he's not going to be? No, I don't know. Okay, what I was going to say is that given that, so if I was I knew that I'm not going to be there. I would make extra effort to answer every question. And I think he just answered a couple, which was like the same, or like it was like a very, it wasn't a, a good explanation given. So to me, that was not very compelling. And I don't know. So I don't know. I'd, yeah. Um, before I go to Pat, I will answer the question that Shalini asked. So we had a deadline to submit SOIs of basically the 6th, today's what, the 23rd, the 16th at 9 a.m. I made it as late as possible because even as of the 12th and 13th, we were still getting CAFs um, submitted. And so I was trying to give, given the policy of seven days for publishing, as much time as possible for people who were submitting CAFs on the 13th or even on the 14th to be able to submit something and remain an applicant. So John Varner submitted his CAF after we had set the interview date. Normally, if the, for anyone who submits a CAF before the interview dates are set, we work with everyone to make sure they can attend. So that is one instance where because we had already set the interview date and then a CAF was submitted, there was no opportunity really to work with additional applicants to find a time for everyone to be able to attend. Um, when I uh, Initially, when I responded with, this is the interview date, he responded, he can't make it, so he'll just have to wait till the next time. About a week later, and I believe this was on the 11th, maybe the 10th, I, it, having received something from Pam and then thinking through it in my mind, wait, we did something similar last year. Um, I offered him the opportunity without any promises that said, if you submit your SOI by the SOI deadline, and then if you submit written answers to the interview questions by, I think I told him the 21st, so 48 hours in advance of the meeting, um, that I would put them in the packet, I would put his name as an applicant, and then I would leave it up to CRC and then the council, CRC to make a recommendation on whether to waive the policy. If it does, then make a recommendation on appointment. And then I explained to him that that still doesn't mean it would go through because the council would formally have to waive the policy. Um, so I made him no promises, but I offered that as a potential for him without being able to attend the interview to do it. I believe I received both his SOI and his application um, answers to the interview questions the same day I made that offer. I know I received them at the same time. I think it was the same day within hours and not the next day. So the, the interview, the responses to the interview questions were received at the same time as the SOI before the SOI deadline. He did not take as much time as I offered for 
answering the written interview questions. Um, Pat, you had your hand up and then you yeah. took it down. Yeah, I got tired of holding it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I figured you'd remember. Um, like uh, Chalonet, I feel comfortable uh, waiving the criteria in this instance, because I think flexibility is important. And I think it's really possible that someone, you know, can't make the actual interview um, something, you know, and I appreciate um, that the SOI was returned and the questions were answered uh, and received in plenty of time uh, for them to even be revised. I found his answers to be uh, on the lean side, um, and I'm concerned particularly about his response to that public input is critical. Every one of the people who applied said a version of that because public input is critical. But he, I felt like what he was saying is that was more important than anything else in where I was hearing the other candidates talking about balancing. The other thing is whose public input would drive the decision. You know, if I look at the moratorium that I lost, uh, and I, so I'm using it as an example because that feels like I'm not impinging on anybody. Uh, there, you know, public opinion was out there saying, don't cut down forests. And public opinion was out there, cut it down. They weren't saying it like that, but you know, cut it down. And I didn't win. So was I not listened to or the people who were, you know, maybe, maybe not. I think that's why I'm leery of resting on public opinion because who's who's and and I think that his answers were very very lean uh, and in some and in in a way I felt like a little disrespected which it's hard to make me feel disrespected um, because I don't like rules um, so I, I'm not, I'm very uncomfortable with this gentleman. I don't know him at all, but I'm uncomfortable and don't want to support his candidacy. Jennifer. Um, so I actually think that I would very much like to see him as an associate. And I think he and Sarah Marshall might, because they gave, they kind of came, they did come out that response, that question, you know, from a little different perspectives. She said um, that she would ultimately fall on the side, you know, that, that she would give more weight to, you know, property owners' rights. And I, I guess I didn't read him as giving more weight to public comment, just, but if you did, I think they might balance each other out well. Um, he's written a number of, he's extru you know, I, He's written a number of um, articles. I mean, they've even been in the Gazette. So he's very engaged. And I think he lives in South Amherst, which I, um, so he comes from a different, you know, um, he'd bring a different part of town, I think, to the ZBA. So I, I think, you know, I would like to see him get a shot as um, for one year as an alternate or associate member, excuse me. And I think that that, between you know those two candidates would bring maybe different perspectives and a good balance to the one-year associate positions. Thank you. Um, I struggle with whether to waive the policy because in some sense it's unfair to those that could show up yet at the same time, I understand all of the concerns and everything. And last year I actually did vote to waive the CRC policy and I would likely on a motion today to vote to recommend to waive the policy. Um, but I do think it, it, given that it's happened two years in a row, we might need to look at modifying a policy or something um, because waiving every year is not always necessarily, maybe we need to reconsider the policy. Um, I have the same concerns that Pat and, um, Shalini have regarding his answers. Um, they were lean. Um, I did not put any word limits or reading limits at all on, on his answers when I wrote and offered him the opportunity to af offer written answers. I did not say whether I would read them or not. I was waiting to see how long they were and whether they'd fit in the three minutes, but I did not put any of that in. Um, I was actually really concerned with his answer um, regarding 
it wasn't the public input one. It was it was the prior. It was the number four, I think, the one that talks about interests and whose oh, yes. interests. And and he seemed to talk about this this um, the way I read it was that abutters have overarching interests over the property owner themselves and that if the property you know if the butters lived there for so long and nothing's been done to their neighboring property or that neighboring property is x use that that a butter should be able to keep x use on a property they don't own and force that other owner that's maybe applied for y use to not be able to change it to Y use because the abutters live there for 30 years. And that really concerns me, um, you know? And so, so I think, you know, I'm, I'm willing to waive or vote to waive the policy, yet I'm not sure I can vote to recommend him. Um, at the same time, we are desperate in need of ZBA people. Um, and so I, I think my thoughts are to leave this up to the council. So I'm going to propose two things. Um, I'm going to make two different motions. The first one is to recommend that the town council waive the policy and I'll read the full motion. I, I gave these potentially ahead of time to Athena so she has them in writing, <laughs> just so you know, that's why I'm making all of these to make her life easier. And then if that passes, I will also move um, to recommend his appointment as an associate member, just so we can have that vote. I don't know. It sounds like I know which way that vote will go, but I think it it deserves a vote. Um, and because there are openings, and then whichever way it goes, it will still end up at the council. Then um, somehow, I'm not sure how. I'll deal with it with Pam as we write the report, but. Um, but it would still, at least there'll be a vote there and we are only five and there are 13. Um, and so I can't know what a council would do, but that's my plan and proposal. Um, Jennifer, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, just because I didn't, since um, when I was relaying Pam's message, oh, yep. we're only talking about the three. So yes. Pam did say she would be comfortable with John Barner as an associate. I just wanted to add that. Excellent. So the first motion I'm going to make is move to recommend the town council waive section nine interviews of the town council policy on making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies for John Varner, as he was unable to attend the interview for ZBA applicants that was scheduled prior to his submission of a community activity form, but did provide to CRC written answers to the adopted interview questions. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, I think we're on to Jennifer. Uh, yes. And Shalini? Yes. Uh, Pat? Aye. And Mandy is an aye on that. So that is a unanimous vote um, with one absent on that one. And the next motion is to move to recommend that the town council appoint John Varner as associate member to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a term effective July 1, 2022 and ending June 30, 2023. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Jennifer no. seconds that. Is there any further discussion on that? Seeing none, we start, we're back around to the beginning. Shalini. No. Pat. No. Mandy is a no. Jennifer. Yes. That is a one to three um, with one absent. Um, and so that will, I will write that report. Um, I will have a report out. I, I need to touch base with Pam somehow, probably through texting at this point, because um, she was going to write as much of it as possible. And then I was going to write the, the summary. Um, so we will do that and I will get that report out and I will touch base with Athena on how to deal with that on the motion sheet and on the agenda itself. Um, thank you all for that. Shalini's raising her hand because there's a district meeting starting in four minutes. I know that. We did not get through the rest of our agenda. Um, we don't have a meeting scheduled till July 14. Yay. Before I say yay though, we don't have a plan or agreement on questions for any survey before we do our public community forum uh, on July 25th. Um, so 
before I adjourn the meeting, I need to know whether the CRC wants to try and schedule a separate meeting earlier in order to do that or whether it is okay. And I'm, I'm not even sure which way I go on this or, you know, Shalini's provided an Excel spreadsheet. There are some questions in that, I believe, um, with some proposals. The questions are more important than the rest of that sheet at this point, but there was also like who to distribute to and all. Um, is it so? So does this committee want to schedule another meeting at some point to get through that, or does the committee want to just assign it to someone who can then informally consult with at least one other to come up with stuff and get something out? What is the committee's preference? Just consult and get it done with some like I just put in the first set of questions, but I would definitely want feedback. So maybe uh, people can send feedback and then to one person and then that one person can work with another person to confirm. Because I'll be traveling in July middle. So I'll try to yeah attend. Are you going to be here on the 25th? 25th of July, yes. Okay. I'm just going to be away from 10, 8, uh, uh, on the 14th, I will be away. And I'll be like traveling back, so I may not be able to attend. Yeah, I'll be away on the 25th, but I will try to. Mm. I'll try. So if CRC wants to meet to discuss all of this, I would recommend we do it next Thursday at our typical time, if we're all available. Mm -hmm um on the 30th um okay in, well or or if people like shalini's idea um if if we say shalini's got the final go ahead on what goes on that survey i think anyone giving her responses or feedback doesn't violate because she's got the final say and only she has the final say and it just goes out. Um, if people are comfortable with that, we can skip the meeting and and if Shalini's comfortable with that too, and I don't know whether she is, um, we can skip that meeting and and work to get something out so that we have some surveys out shortly after July 4th. And this is the surveys or the public forum because public forum we can all people can always add other questions. It's not like this is the yeah. Final. So so the question is, do we want the survey out before the public forum? If not, then we don't have to worry about the survey. I think it's good because it'll give us a pretest of what kind of responses we're getting and what questions we can ask in the public forum. Sounds like no one wants to add a meeting, so we're going to assign this to Shalini to finalize surveys. Um, I'll be in touch, Shalini, with mm -hmm. you on how to do that. I know you had a number of questions about things like what surveys we can use. So I think, Dave, you're still mm -hmm. hanging out. I think you, Shalini, Dave, and I mm -hmm. need to get together soon. Um, if Shalini is available tomorrow, maybe we can find a time hooked on to my 11 a.m. meeting. Okay, I really need to go now. Yeah, no, but, so, but we'll but, do that yes. so that we can figure out how we can do the mm. survey. Is that agreeable to everyone? Yes. I mean, y'all no can discuss, anything, so but, yeah. but y'all can keep discussing because it looks like Jennifer is still thinking about it, so no pressure. No, no, I'm just saying yeah. I could meet, I, I would be yeah. fine to meet an extra time if that's what. Mm -hmm. Right. But you should go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for my link to go. Okay. <laughs> I would meet an extra time, but I prefer that Shalane take it on okay. and that we not meet. Okay. Let me think about it. I'll let you guys know really quickly tomorrow what what the decision is um, on that. Um, with that, Shalane, you can go. We still have to get Thank through. You. Um, I, I have to say one thing, which is, um, General public comment, public comment on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. Residents are welcome to express their views for one to three minutes, up to three minutes at the discretion of the chair, um, up to three minutes. Um, if you want to make general public comment, please raise your hand right now. No hands, so general public comment is closed. I will tell Steve, since he is here, that I saw his email. Um, he's our ECAC liaison um, to this committee. Um, and Steve, I'm going to get back to you on that. So <laughs> expect an email from me tonight on, on your email. Um, 
we're not doing minutes tonight. We're going to just, unless we can right now, if no one's got changes, I can easily make that motion. So I move to adopt the June 9, 2022 meeting minutes. Second. Um, Jennifer, we're voting. Aye. Pat? Aye. And Mandy is an aye. They're adopted three to zero. Um, with that, um, we are adjourning the meeting at 6.32 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you all. See you. Bye-bye.